Baby, you're in your jeans. What? I think you're on. Go ahead and tell me. Hey, how are you? Is that Tim or Adam? I can't see. Hi, Adam. Can you hear yourself okay? Yeah, I hear me. I hear me good and loud. I guess. I can hear it. Adam, can I have a little bit more piano? More piano, please. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. I hear you. <clears throat> yeah. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of
this evening at North Hollywood Church of Religious Science for our pre-service meditation. Let's just all take a deep breath together and breathe into the silence, feeling the presence of God that lives within us. We're just going to know that God is here expressing in, through, and as each and every person here. I invite you simply to get still and close your eyes as we play God is the love that I am. You may sit and listen or you're welcome to chant along.
Welcome to those of us who have those of you who have joined us here this evening while meditation was in progress. I am. We are so very glad that you are here with us this evening, either virtually or in person. Let us begin with our opening chant, God is in this place. So indeed, God is in this place. So let us join together in prayer, just becoming more conscious of our awareness of God, being in this place and in this place, inside each and every one of us. God it never abandons us. God is always with us. God is that bright consciousness that guides us through every moment of every day when we take time to pay attention. And I know right now that my attention is on my inner goodness, the highest goodness, that I am able to express in the moment. This is something I strive for and declare that each and every person here is able to do that. We can always find that inner spark, that awareness that guides us to say the right thing at the right time. And we help one another and ourselves to feel better, to become aware of this consciousness, which we call love and joy and togetherness and forgiveness and gratitude that is in this place that I call my heart which is my, where God lives, but God lives in every pore, every cell of my body, as I know it does for each and every person here. And it is with a happy heart that I become more and more aware of this in all that I do, think, say, and pray. And I am so grateful for everyone who is able to join us here this evening, virtually or in person, or just in mind and thought, that I know that your thoughts and prayers are here with us, each and every one of us, creating a higher level of consciousness as we go through our days. I am grateful for the church. I am grateful for the thought that keeps us in place here. I am grateful for the ministers and practitioners and the board of musicians and the congregation that supports our being here. And it is with a happy heart I release this prayer into the law of mind, where it's made beautifully and eloquently manifest in, through, and as each and every person. And Together we simply say, Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from error. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The time has come. and 
friendships and sealing wax of cabbages and kings. The heart was numb, the word was mum. wrote that? Oh, I was not even close. <laughs> it was gorgeous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For us, the time has come. Well, hello, welcome. Hey, Zoomers, Facebookers, live streamers, whatever form you are joining us tonight, we're glad you're here. And continuing on with uh, what we've been discussing for the last several weeks, the season for nonviolence. Today, my topic is inner and outer freedom. So this is the description. Whenever I come up with a topic, I have to write a paragraph for myself. And sometimes I'll give it to whoever is take, putting stuff up on the website and all of that so that there's a bit of promo for it. But it's mostly for me, so I know what the heck I'm gonna talk about. And what I wrote um, was this. Freedom in the world is intimately connected to the freedom each of us allows within. Every time you and I free ourselves from our own beliefs of shame and unworthiness, we contribute to the freedom in the outer world as well. From there, we can serve our world in wholeness and support everyone in living lives of freedom, safety, and peace. So... Season for Nonviolence, as some of you may be aware, was started several years ago as a tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mohatma Gandhi, and it is based on the principles that they taught. 
And it is a period that goes from the anniversary of the death of Gandhi's assassination to the anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. And so, sorry, I have to say this right, Dr. Martin Luther King. That doctor is essential in my mind. For So anyway, and the idea of this is that we look at those areas within ourselves in which we might, might have been contributing or holding in place systems that are less than peaceful, less than loving, less than just, so that we might begin to interrogate them, um, dissolve them, disempower them, heal all of that so that we are no longer contributing or projecting out into the world our own fears, our own limitations, our, our superstitions. Um, you know, you might have heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people. And that's kind of the idea, really. In fact, it's definitely the idea. It's what we know here in this teaching that all work starts within. All healing starts within. All forgiveness is self-forgiveness. All of that which we desire to see in our lives starts first with a change in our awareness that, first of all, that it's possible, that we are worthy, and that we actually are already sourced and surrounded by everything we need because we live in this, this infinite potentiality, this pool, this, this substance, this energy, this flow, this, this limitless circle that is God. St. Augustine said, it is that presence whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And so when we know that God is centered in us and we are centered in God, and as we practice that and really take that in, take that in, take that in, then we have less need, less desire, less urgency to blame the world for situations in our own lives, our own experiences. And it allows us to grow up and to become mature beings, to become adults, spiritual adults, spiritual men and women. So this idea of freedom, I was really looking at it because I, it would be easy to go to that place of... freedom in America, freedom for all people, and you know, um, the collective ideas about freedom, all of that, it's really important, and we, we work with that, of course, all the time, but I wanted to go deeper tonight so that we can really own our part in creating a world that's free, and it starts within. So as I was just dancing with this idea in my mind, I thought of the words to, um, you know, the from, she didn't write them, but she is one of the iconic mystics of our generation, Janis Joplin. And the words from Bobby McGee, she said, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And I started working with that today, and I thought, well, I will never be that zen. I will never be there. Um, however, one of the greatest things which you and I can learn and practice is non-attachment non-attachment. And so I have to start with me. And the first thing I did was, well, what are the kinds of attachment that I am working with the most right now? And I have two kinds, material and emotional attachment. So the material attachment, and this is the stuff that enslaves us, by the way. This is the inner freedom part. If we are caught by this, if we are keeping the systems in place within ourselves that keep us from being free and um, completely liberated, liberated and independent and moving into a great experience of joyful, loving, happy living, then we are not free. So for me, the material attachment is things like my shoes, oh God, my shoes, my appearance, my things, and the problem isn't the things themselves, okay? It's the way we define ourselves or value our lives according to our things, right? So while I like to think of myself as not being completely attached to and trapped by my stuff, the truth is that I love my creature comforts. I love beauty. I really enjoy my books. I love my bed. I love my coffee maker. And, you know, I love my shoes, apparently. Having a lot of stuff, though, means 
having a lot of responsibility. So, you know, maintaining my stuff is a responsibility. It takes time and effort to maintain my books, my bed, my coffee maker, and you know, the shoes. But there's, and there's nothing wrong with any of that unless I'm more concerned about my things and my relationship to them than the meaning in my life. The meaning in my life. So in Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, um, he wrote this. When a man cannot find meaning, he numbs himself with pleasure. When a man or woman cannot find meaning, we numb ourselves with pleasure. So when distraction and pleasure occupy a greater space in our lives than meaning, I believe there is no freedom. What masquerades as freedom is actually permissiveness, rebellion, and narcissism. So when we give ourselves permission to have all that stuff, to do all that stuff, because that's what, that's what we feel charges us and gets us going and excites us and, and gives us the meaning and the power and all of the joy that we want in our lives, we are actually in a state of permissiveness, radical permissiveness, and rebellion and narcissism. Let me go, let me go a little bit deeper. It's a very Im immature emotional place to be. Toddlers are the master of narcissism and rebellion. And that's exactly what they're supposed to be. That's their job. And the idea is that they're always angling for, you know, the permissiveness. So they're always going to be there. So besides the whole material attachment thing that I reckon with, I'm also aware that I might have some issues around emotional attachment. Anybody here? Um, I define emotional attachment as needing to have everything turn out the way I, I think it should. Right? Seems really easy, you know. Um, and you might do this if you feel sometimes that people just aren't behaving the way you think they should. Um, if you're trying to control their behavior or their choices, you might want to look at that. You know, parenting is one long lesson in healing your own emotional attachments to having your own way or at the very least being fine when you don't get your own way, which is all the time. Sounds like toddler consciousness again, right? So I think in many ways our American collective psyche is in a prolonged toddler stage. You know, I used to think it was prolonged adolescence, considering the age of our country relative to other countries. Um, I think it's mostly toddler. There is some adolescence in there because, you know, anyone who's been around a teenager, you know that sometimes it's as if there's a regression that takes place and they go back to, I want it and I want it now, that, that frame of mind. But I think right now we are all learning vital lessons of growth and maturity. This doesn't mean everyone is a baby, although I can cop to being a spoiled brat sometimes when my third world problems seem insurmountable. You know, um, not enough closet space. I'm out of sparkling water. Or, man, my Amazon delivery was supposed to be here yesterday. Those are the third world problems I'm talking about. And this toddler consciousness is fascinating. Um, they, toddlers and young children and adolescents have these traits in common. They blame others for their problems. They want what they want when they want it. When they don't get their way, they yell that it's not fair. And compassion for others is still mostly a, a work in progress or a theoretical idea. Anyone know any children or adolescents who behave that way? Anyone know any adults? Yeah? Anyone close to you? No one here, I'm certain. No one here, I'm sure of that. So this mindset of blame, judgment, and it's just not fair is the mindset you and I have to transcend. We must liberate ourselves from if we want to be happy, if we want to be free. We must explore this mindset within ourselves and disempower it if we want to have meaning in our lives. Meaning. The mindset of blame, judgment, and it's just not fair is a default mindset, by the way. It's convenient and also completely useless. It's completely useless. It offers no power, no freedom, no responsibility, no accountability. It's completely dependent, and there's no freedom at all within it, none whatsoever. Socrates wrote that the unexamined life is not worth living. 
And our unexamined default mindsets are in great need of examination and healing and transformation. I think. Anybody else? <laughs> there can be no freedom when our default is blame, judgment, fear, and comparison. So again, here's another little reality check for you. If you find yourself experiencing road rage at the grocery store, you may be ready for some self-examination. And you know what I mean. You're in line and somebody's in front of you and they just don't do what they're supposed to do. All right. So I just want to give you a little warning here. I'm about to talk about the Bible. So shut the doors. Don't anybody get triggered. Don't check out. Don't go unconscious on me. I teach the Bible metaphysically, and that means that there are hugely deeper meanings that go well beyond the words or what you and I might have been taught as historical or literal. When we look at the Bible, we are talking about aspects of our own thinking, of our own selves. It's perhaps the greatest psychological book, the psychology manual ever written. Every name, every number, every location, every event has deeper significance and deeper meaning. And these interpretations can transform how you and I understand ourselves and the world around us. So everybody's still here, take a breath. It's Bible, but it's, it's not toxic, okay? Come on, just everybody breathe with me. So here's a little bit of Metaphysical Bible 101. Adam, you remember Adam, right? The guy in the garden blamed his wife. <laughs> he represents who we are before we realize our inner divinity, our innate divinity as beloved creations of spirit. He is that toddler, human, earthbound part of us the sense being of us, right? The five senses. And if we don't detect it with our five senses, it must not be true. Now, Christ is who we are when we realize our oneness within, with, with and as God. Now, don't get caught in the trap of, of thinking, oh God, she's going into Jesus land. I'm, I'm going into metaphysical Jesus land, okay? Jesus is the realization of the divine walking on the planet, okay? And that Christ part of us literally means awake, anointed. It means the light. It is that light within. We all have, you can call it your Buddha self, that Christ self, the Christ light within, that Christ beingness. You can call it whatever you want. For the sake of clarity, I'll refer to it as that Christ beingness within, that Christ self. Christed means anointed. Now, it wasn't, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, Jesus' last name wasn't Christ. Christ was the title of teacher, wise one, anointed, awake one. His, he would have been referred to as Yeshua ben Joseph, son of Joseph. So the biggest thing I want to offer you tonight is that the scriptures teach us that we sleep with Adam. We sleep with Adam, we sleep as Adam, and we wake with Christ, as Christ. In other words, we sleep collectively and we wake individually. So take that in for a minute. We sleep collectively, we wake individually. We walk the world collectively. We heal ourselves as we explore our beliefs individually. We might participate in the beliefs collectively. We might join in with ideas in the, what we call the race mind, the collective mind, all of that. But we must do the work individually. And again, what happens is as we do that, then the entire energetic vibration of this planet begins to create in a higher way. So there is that Adam self that we sleep as and that Christ self in which we awaken. Another way to think of it is we sleep and numb out in limitation and we awaken to our limitlessness. Our divine assignment is to awaken to the divine truth of our own being. We are here to awaken to our Christed selves and to die to our limited ideas of who and what we are. 
I die daily. That's what that means. You might have heard that from the Bible. I die daily. It means to die to our sensory self. It means to die to our ego, to our judgment, to those earthbound ideas of limitation, of fear, of judgment, so that we might live, be reborn in a consciousness of divine knowing, of possibility, possibility of, of infinite possibility. So Charles Fillmore, who was the co-founder of Unity, has, uh, is well known as one of the most profound interpreters and um, authors of metaphysical Bible studies. And this is one of the things that I found. And he defined this idea of dying to self. Signifies man's willingness to die to the little personal self so that he may be or she may be absorbed into divine mind. Think about that. When we let go of that stuff which has held us down, which has entrapped us, kept us from being free, and we allow ourselves to be absorbed into the awareness of divine mind, we lay down the mortal thought of life and take up the spiritual idea of life. It opens the door to the realization that the I am, the I am, the mystical I am, has creative power and can express the life manifestation in divine order. Now, I am, I am, I am, the mystical I am, the mystical I am. When Moses asked the burning bush, who the heck are you? I am that I am, I am that I am. And the first I am is what we say about ourselves. That second I am is who we are. And Emma Curtis Hopkins is one who always taught that whatever you follow that phrase, I am with, becomes God to you. It becomes God to you because the divine I am is God. I am. I am. I am divine. I am free. I am awake. I am whole. I am complete. That is the divine within me. We awake in that individual consciousness and knowing of Christ so that we might be part of the greater knowing, participate in the greater knowing. Adam represents our human self, the one with judgments, blame, comparisons, and the need to control the world around us. Our Christ self is the infinite, sacred, eternal, fully connected God light that you and I really are. The freedom we seek to express, the freedom we want for ourselves, the freedom we yearn for for others, for others on this planet, for everyone, and that is a holistic urge. It is a whole urge. It is that, that, that divine call, that the deep calling to deep is that Christ or that light within which is inviting us to know ourselves as God knows us, as God knows us, and to know everyone else as God knows them, as divine beings, that we are sharing in this, this sea, this stuff of which we are in the center, and there is no circumference. We are called to freedom, but if we are attached to our human ideas of ourselves as limited or having to control or less than worthy, we will not be free. And we won't be very anxious to give freedom to anybody else or to help them have freedom, to help them reach freedom. Because ingrained in us, for some reason, can be this fear of the other. We fear that, that somebody else might take away what we have or might, might get there first. And all of that is sourced in one just very simple idea that we think there isn't enough, that we think God isn't all there is, that there's something, there's God and mm, something else. It is that separation that is keeping us entombed. It is that separation that is keeping us in chains. It is that separation that is not allowing us to cultivate the grace that is already present, that longs to bless everyone so that we all might know freedom and access and justice and equality and safety and opportunity. 
as long as we are attached to that Adam self, and the Adam self is fine, we get to have our human experience, but as long as we are attached to it and we don't dare go beyond it, then we are going to be cultivating more of the fear and the limits than the joy and the freedom. There are a number of verses, again, I'm going to say that nasty word, in the Bible, in Ephesians, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Now, that's old language. Just hear that as old language that happened when, when uh, the King James Bible was published. So don't attach to that, because really what the real meaning is, is things of a lower nature, okay? Things, of earthly things, you know, the sense world, as opposed to, you know, get God first, go to God first. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness in Colossians and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and again, that doesn't mean the old ideas of Christ, but in that awareness, the deep awareness of light and who and what we are because we are if we are in that, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. So I love what Ernest Holmes wrote. There is then no limitation outside our own ignorance. And since we can all conceive of a greater good than we have so far experienced, we all have the ability to transcend previous experiences and rise triumphant above them but we shall never triumph over them while we persist in going through the old mental reactions. Ugh. So anybody go through something and you find yourself reacting in a way that you might have reacted a while ago, or you're triggered because, gee, my parents did that, or I remember being hurt by that from this old relationship, or this happens, I just know this is so in the world. This is what we are seeking to let go of. We just want to let go of it. So I want us to have some practical meaning and application. And again, I stole from Viktor Frankl, and he wrote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So between stimulus and response. So for example, the stimulus might be a flat tire on the way to the bank. In between the stimulus and the response is that space. So there's the space and the response. How about the choice to breathe, to bless, to not blame yourself or your partner for driving on a road that's clearly not something one should be driving on? Stimulus, the person on TV who rants about the evils of your particular values or your political ideals. Space. Response. Take a moment to extend compassion, forgiveness, and love to yourself first. And then remembering that although positive thinking doesn't seem to have any effect whatsoever, productive thinking does. And positive action can transform this planet. So when we strive to move beyond positive thinking, because I agree it doesn't work, but productive thinking into positive action, we can transform our lives, ourselves, the planet. Nelson Mandela wrote, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. As long as one of us isn't free, then none of us are free. As long as one of us isn't free, none of us are free. And not to put too fine a point on it, Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu wrote, if you want peace, you don't talk to your friends, you talk to your enemies. Those enemies start within, guys. They start within. We have to be willing to look at our ideas of judgment, of discrimination, of racism, of fear, of the other, of not enough, of not being good enough, of God maybe not being fully love, and to begin to have a conversation with that so that we can 
begin to mature away from that adolescent and toddler mindset. 1 Corinthians, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became an adult, I put away the things of childhood. You and I are big now. Let's liberate and free ourselves from the need to judge, to hate, to react, and to protect ourselves and to look for reasons to stay separate. Love lifts us up, it heals, it connects us, and it frees us. And we find it by turning within to that presence, that infinite presence here, which is already awake. It is already awake and active. We turn away from our addiction to the sense world of Adam, of our Adam natures, and we discover we are so much more. We are the living and fully embodiment of God, free, perfect, complete, and whole. Let's pray. So we turn within in recognition that indeed the infinite, the infinite that is God, that presence, that universal heart, mind, soul has no circumference, yet is all center. Therefore, it is centered within each and every one of us and we are centered in it. And I know that in that we are so fully connected, not just with God and as God, but with each other. That that one mind inhabits all time and space and eternity and inhabits each of us. And therefore, we declare right now that we are open and receptive to being, being informed by it. To be informed by wholeness, to be informed by freedom, to be informed by love by peace, by worthiness, to be informed by divine, the divine itself, to know that nothing and no one is left out of that field of God. And that we are all, we are all in that. And that the most true thing, the most true thing, in fact, perhaps let's just say the only true thing about us is God. Everything else, let's let it fall away as we move into this deep, wonderful awareness that right where we are, God is fully and freely, wonderfully, beautifully. What a joy to know that there is enough and that we choose now to elevate our beliefs from that limited toddler sense into being spiritual adults, adults in God, adults on this planet with a childlike wonder, childlike awareness and, and gratitude and receptivity and yet with the capacity to know that we are infinite and that we are fully connected as the divine expression, divine brothers and sisters. So I know that for all of us, as we are swimming in this sea of God, that if anything is calling to us that, that concerns us, we surround it with love, knowing that God is already there. If someone in our family is appearing to be in need of healing or more love or greater compassion, greater support, supply, we know that God is already present there, active, active, and in full glorious expression. And we particularly open our hearts to the knowing of peace in this country, of peace on this planet, and especially right now, we extend our hearts to the Ukraine. We extend our hearts to Russia. We close no one out. We know that we are all one. And that the heart of God beats within every being. The presence of God is alive in every being. The truth of God is active, expressing, and dancing in full celebration and glory in all beings. So we bless this church, 
We bless all churches, all paths to God, ashrams, temples, synagogues, cathedrals, wherever people gather, or even at home in that temple that is your temple and within. We know that we are all connected in that upper room of consciousness and that nothing can separate us, even ourselves. How beautiful to know that we celebrate this and that we are the walking embodiment of God. That we are the celebration of God. We are God's demonstration, each and every one of us. I am grateful to know this. I am so grateful to know this. And I invite you to say with me, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. So with a full and grateful heart, I release these words into divine law. And I let God do its job. I let law do its job. I let all of it just do what it needs to do. I step back from the how and I simply love, knowing it is already so and so it is. Together we say, Amen. Amen. song. So, (laughs) oh, life is a flow. It is a flow. It's not downhill. It's not uphill. It's a flow. And so we complete that circle of the flow by our gifts of our giving and our receiving. And so right now we're going to do our affirmative giving, our grateful giving. And so I invite you to take your offering and hold it in your hand. And if your offering is something that you do automatically, like I do online, then I want you to just know that your hand is full, full, full with this light of that gift and hold it to your heart. And would you say with me, from the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly.
Thank you. In a minute, Mary Catherine O'Hart will come up with their announcements. And by the way, those are some cool shoes. Oh, you can't have them. Well, they wouldn't fit me anyway. <laughs> so last week, we brought Blair Thompson, the president of our board of trustees, up so that we could sing happy birthday to him. And he's back again because he really liked it. <laughs> now, actually, he's here for another reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We've got a whole thing going on here, don't we? That's right. Um, hi. Like you said, I'm Blair Thompson. I'm the president of the board, for those of you who don't know. Um, I can either read this or kind of wing it, and uh, I'm just feeling a little brave tonight. Um, so what, I, what I'm here for is we're a nonprofit organization. We're a corporation. As such, we have to have an annual meeting, one meeting once a year of our membership. What's important to know about this is we need to have a quorum. We need to have enough people to vote to make this official. So the important part is... What's it take to be a member? Well, you may or may not know, and it got confusing last year, so we want to be a little more clear about it this year. You need to have gone to the quick start classes, and you need to have gotten your paperwork back from the office saying that you are. If you're not, not sure, call the office and find out this week, okay? Let's do it beforehand so that there's no confusion, no hurt feelings, no upset on the day of. Um, February 27th is the day at 1130. Um, when you sign, it's only on Zoom. It's not on Facebook. It's, we can be here in person, or you can be on Zoom, not Facebook, okay? Don't try and go to Facebook, because Facebook doesn't let us take attendance the right way. So when you go on Zoom, don't sign on as Mickey Mouse. Sign on as your name, okay? If it's you and your, your spouse or, or, or a significant, significant other, or there's two people, put both those people's names there so that the people who are taking attendance can, can cross-reference it to our list, okay? That's really important. Um, everybody's welcome at the meeting. Only members can vote. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, uh. So, again, it's just on Zoom or in person. It's not on Facebook, okay? Uh, to get onto Zoom, go to our website, nhcrs.org. Um, there's a great big link there, a button there that says Zoom. You go there, and it'll take you right there. Um, I know a lot of you Wednesday people don't always come on Sundays. If you're only going to come to one Sunday service this year, this is the one. We were really, <laughs> we were really close last year in our quorum. We were two people over at two minutes tell. <laughs> please don't do this to us, that to us again. We panicked, and uh, <laughs> please come. It, it's, it's really quick. It's like 15 or 20 minutes. Dr. Mark cuts a few jokes. Um, just come to service on that day, and you don't even really have to stay for the meeting because we start the meeting during service, and... Dr. Mark always steps his game up a little bit for his, his message on that day, so come. Um, so that's it. Please come to the, the, the annual meeting. Uh, a lot of people have also asked what's going on with our, our COVID protocols, with our masking. Um, we've decided that we are going to continue with COVID protocols indefinitely. Um, we're going to see how things go, but even though the mandates are, are stopping, in service, in the sanctuary here, we're going to respect each other. We're going to respect the people that may have uh, immune deficiencies or whatever, and we're going to keep the masks on for a while. So I don't think it's a big ask, um, and I think it, it really is going to help. Um, so um, I'll hope to see you uh, Sunday the 27th. Yeah. Okay? Yep. Good. Thank you. The wonderful thing about an annual meeting is that you're part of this community, which makes you shareholders. You're stewards. So come and see what we've been doing, you know, on your behalf and with the, the gifts that you give us and get a sense of the vision that we have for the future because we're doing some really great stuff. We're working and revamping our curriculum and our classes and all of that, and we really want you to have a voice in it. It's not just people here spewing. We want a group spew, okay? <laughs> We had a lot of business that we dealt with. This year, we got some good good plans. We got some. We're, we're going some different directions. You know, yeah. I see that we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of this dark time. Um, and um, oh, come forward. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and uh, so we got some exciting stuff to talk about. We got some exciting plans. Come come hear about it. It's not going to be as boring as last year was. We had <laughs> bylaws. We had to change and stuff like that. It was ugh. okay. So we hope to see you. Thank you. Boy, oh boy, you just can't give some people a mic. <laughs> what has happened to him? <laughs> so, thank you. Um, truly, I, I want to just make um, 
an off script mention, how unusual. Um, and just truly to thank the board and the congregants and the ministers and practitioners and everyone who, the volunteers in the office, who just really love and support this church and the, those who do, do tithes and everything. Because there's a lot of churches that have closed and our board has, have made the difficult decisions that they have to keep us open, but we are open. And I want to start off with the announcements to tell you that your consciousness has worked and thank you, it's official, that starting March 6th, we will be going back to two services. <laughs> Woohoo! So that is truly prayer and consciousness and God in action. And I am very, very grateful for that. But just please remember that only the 945 service will be on Zoom and Facebook. And um, that's when we're gonna have the um, child care available as, as well. So let me look at what I'm saying here. Thank you, Reverend Sydney, for those lovely gems that you gave us. Look at my mask is even studded with them because there were so <laughs> I had so many puns to tell tonight because I, I showed her a note. I lost the announcements, but I actually had left them up here. So um, God provided me with a copy of last Wednesday night's um, announcements. So I was going through editing them and adding what I could remember. But now God has provided the actual real announcement. So um, there are um, ways, different ways to make donations at the church. And we don't have to say all those numbers and phone numbers anymore. You can just simply go to nhcrs.org. Uh, slash forward slash give unless you're here in person, in which case you can just throw it in a nice little cardboard box in the back. <laughs> no worries, no one protects it and counts it. It doesn't all go home with Mary Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> My pockets are heavy, yeah, I know. Prayer with a practitioner is available after service in person here in church or on Zoom. So if you're on Facebook, just jump on over and, and go for a prayer. Our Wednesday evening service with um, Reverend Sydney. Oh. It just says it has the wrong date on here. Okay. Again, it will be at 6.50 next, uh, meditation will begin at 6.50 next Wednesday night, and service will begin at 7 o'clock. What am I talking about? I don't know. <laughs> but it says that um, it's the season for nonviolence, radical forgiveness. Oh, yeah. That will make so. you all very uncomfortable. I hope you'll come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the grief support group will meet on Zoom at one o'clock on Sunday. Please join them. It's uh, practitioner Carol Winninger hosts this, and she's really, really good at this. And that's a good place also to practice radical forgiveness. Living a Course in Miracles, the class is on Zoom with our practitioner Jeannie Laporte. It meets tomorrow night. That's February 17th at 7.15 to 9.15 p.m. and it's on Zoom and the information is on our website. Feeding the Homeless, our Love and Kindness Ministry will be feeding the homeless this Sunday at 12.30 p.m. To support this ministry, please go to our website. Volunteers and donations are always welcome. It's a wonderful, wonderful practice. Gilda has been doing this for quite a while. Our annual meeting is Sunday, February 27th at 11.30. As you heard from, from Blair, it is really important that we do our um, have our responsibility and show up and vote and just listen to what people have to say. Dr. Mark gets it done in like probably 30 minutes or less and then maybe we'll have some special treats for out on the patio. Maybe I'll bake. Okay. Um, thank you again for your consciousness. I already told you that um, the 945 service will be Zoomed and then we will starting March 6th we will have two services thereafter. So that's it. Reverend Sydney is now going to pray us out. I will, indeed. I want to thank a few people. Um, we could not do this without our crew. Well, we could, but there wouldn't be anybody here. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd be in the parking lot, and I'd rather not. So um, we have a, a practitioner holding vigil on, on uh, virtually at home, and that's Liz Racy. So yay, Liz Racy. Our Facebook Live support is Melissa Allen, and our Zoom support tonight is Diane Satterley, Ray Regan, Reverend Nadine, yes, Mark Kroll. Um, and Adam Keshen has been doing our Lights and Sound and Sanctuary. Colleen Butler greeted you and ushed you. Our, our media team is Doreen Remo, Nikki Zavara, Brenda Jordan, and Blair Thompson. Soloist Diane Vincent. 
And I have it on good authority she's going to go home with the piano player because she's married to him, I think. Yeah, you're married. Yes, to each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sam Krieger, thank you. Pulpit support, Mary Catherine O'Hart, thank you. I'm Reverend Sydney. I'm so glad you're here. Let's pray out, shall we? Okay. Oh, and I just want to tell you, March 25th, save the date, it's a Friday at 7 o'clock. We are finally, I mean, I know I've been here now, what, eight months, almost eight months, but we're going to have my installation. So it, it'll become official. Um, so I hope that you'll join us. The whole church is invited. There will be uh, refreshments afterwards, and I have it on good authority that Ernest Holmes might make an appearance again. <laughs> All right, so we just take this time to recognize that the love that is the truth of our being is that which has brought us here, a divine intention, a divine invitation to know ourselves and to know each other in a greater way. And how wonderful that we've been able to share in this, that we've been able to celebrate each other, to celebrate life, to celebrate the wisdom that informs all that we are. Every single part of our physical bodies, our spiritual bodies, our emotional bodies, our social bodies, all of it is God. So I know that we each go forth filled with joy, filled with love, filled with the zest of the here and now, and that we are a blessing in the world. So with so much gratitude, I just simply say thank you, and so it is, and together we say amen. Come home with me.